sorts of things. Oh yeah, I think you did have this. Good evening, everyone. Can you just speak in the way? Yeah, that's right. That's right. I don't care to do that. Yep. Folks and all. I can move my bag. No, that's fine. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming. We're happy to be here with Kathleen to present a final economic development assessment for the town. And before we begin, um, to start with some introductions, I'm Terry Masterson, the Economic Development and Tourism Coordinator for the town. And Kathleen, you can introduce yourself and say hello. And Hi, I'm Kathleen McKay. And I'm um, a consultant specializing in economic development and community planning, and I've been working on economic assessment, and I've talked to several of you at various courses um, over the last 24 months. Um, so glad to be here. Thank you. Jean? I'm Jean Bouvant, town planner. Hi, Jean. New face. Jeff Bridges, town administrator. Maxine Cardinal, your hometown shopper. Yep, thank you, Maxine. Uh, Jane Goodwin, Boris Lutton. Gerald Goodwin, um, open space. Ed Goodwin, uh, CPC and conservation. Very good, thank you. And Mary Dowling. Hello. We're all introducing you, so you, you came at the exact right moment. Oh. We've just started, Alex, and we're just introducing ourselves, so you can say hello for a second. Oh, me? Yes. Oh, Alex. <laughs> With the local chamber of commerce. <laughs> Before we turn the meeting over to Kathleen, I want to take the time to thank her for all of her hard work in authoring this valuable report and to say that your work is really appreciated and it's something that will have a lot of value for the town going forward. The report will offer Sturbridge, I think, many important insights, trends, and data points that will give you direction, especially now as we're coming out of COVID. That's really going to be important. And it will also help us in the months and years ahead if, when we're applying for grants and funding and assistance to have this as a data point, a data source, uh, which is also very valuable. Um, I want to mention that Kathleen will present the draft final report this evening, and then after this meeting, she will incorporate any changes that come from the meeting and then issue a final edition, which we will then post on the town website. Um, and we'll look forward to that. Um, there are some copies of the current draft on the table and also copies of the PowerPoint presentation um, that Kathleen's going to present this evening um, that are available for anyone. And I also um, am happy to say that it's hot off the presses. The ink is barely dry that the um, 2022 um, <laughs> tourism guidebook is also is at the table for anyone to take a copy when they go home. Um, so without further ado, I will turn the table over to Kathleen. Thanks, Terry. So I'm used to walking around, but I was told that I have to kind of stay stationary with the mic. So um, I will try and uh, address it. Uh, one of the things that I want to uh, mention is this economic assessment was part of the Compact Communities Initiative. And we have actually, this is really the third uh, report that we've done as part of it. We did uh, three surveys, a survey of business, a survey of residents, and also then COVID hit, so we did a, a survey of businesses as to thinking about COVID. Uh, and we put that together in a report that Terry's had. And we also uh, were asked to look at how to benchmark and compare 
Sturbridge with five other communities. And we compare Sturbridge with um, Lenox and uh, Stockbridge, as well as two local communities, uh, more uh, uh, West, in Worcester County, Auburn, uh, as well as in southeastern Mass uh, near Taunton, in the community of Raynham. And then we took another community, Portsmouth, New Hampshire, because like you, they have a, a living uh, outdoor museum uh, with the Strawberry Bank. So we wanted to look at those communities. Obviously, Stockbridge was very, uh, a smaller community, about 5,000 people. Uh, Ports, uh, Portsmouth has 35,000 people. But we really looked at those communities. And I think overall, I think uh, Sturbridge was very competitive. I think there's some lessons from each of those communities. Uh, and I'll try, uh, th this presentation doesn't directly speak to that, but we did do a comparative factors report uh, that Terry also has and could share with you. So this really focuses on the economic assessment. And we thought we'd um, start off with really, what is economic development? And I think this sounds like a basic thing, but I think a lot of people scratch their uh, um, head and sometimes wonder, what is economic development in a community like Sturbridge? Well, it's really looking at programs and policies and initiatives that you as a town take or you partner with others that take that affect the place, Sturbridge as a place. What are the amenities? How, what is it like to shop? What is it like to visit? Uh, what's the connectivity, kind of both from a residential perspective as well as a visitor perspective. Talent is increasingly important consideration in terms of economic development uh, and looking at your workforce as, um, in terms of the people who live here as well as the people who work here is an increasingly important thing on how communities are really competitive. So school systems have, become, have always been an important part of residential life. They're becoming more important when you're looking at workforce and uh, in terms of attracting people uh, and employers. So that's something to think about. And resources. People need you know, access to capital. They need access to information. They need access to networks because those networks open doors. So those are the elements of economic development that I think fit Sturbridge. And it's really, you want to attract visitors, you want to foster business growth amongst local companies uh, so that they create jobs and strengthen your local tax base. Um, and it just contributes positively to an overall kind of friendly, lovely community that Sturbridge is. And I think when we're thinking about economic development, sometimes people think about smokestacks or you know big projects but sometimes it's a little thing and it's, it's a range and I think it's really important to be cognizant that it's sometimes it's the speed of permitting that you know and the customer service at town hall as well as the customer service in local restaurants and stores all of those contribute to the image and um, experience that people have in storage so it's all of those things um, and it's important. So you can't talk about economic development these days without really thinking about COVID. So I, wanted, I thought it would be helpful to look at some of the impacts. And really thinking, and I tried to put Sturbridge in context and comparison. So Sturbridge is the dark, thick gold line, and I compared it with Worcester County as well as the Commonwealth. And basically, you know, you know, the Great Recession, we were still f feeling the impacts in tw 2010. So this looks at unemployment over the last decade, and you can see how it really spiked uh, going from 2019 to uh, 2020. At one point, there was 16% unemployment in the Commonwealth because of COVID, I think the highest that it got in Sturbridge was about 14% one month, but you know there were clear uh, impacts. 
Uh, I took three Aprils to, to provide some context. April 2019, April 2020, which is when you know people were really feeling the impact of closing because the orders came down in mid-March, uh, and then April 2021. The unemployment rate is on the top. The dark green shows the number of people unemployed who live in Sturbridge. This is Sturbridge residents. So, you know, coming in pre-pandemic was only 3.3%, but we skyrocketed, as I said, to 15.2%. Today, um, and April 2021 is the most recent data, it's 5.8%. So we're still feeling the impacts. I think the other important piece is the number in the yellow is the size of the labor force. That's people who are employed, as well as people who are actively looking for work. So before COVID, your uh, labor force was, a, in terms of the number of people living in Sturbridge, was about 5,000, almost 5,100 people. Um, during, in April of 2020, it shrunk to just under 4,000. And today, it's back up at 4,800. So I think in terms of the willingness to go back to work amongst residents, uh, that people are starting to, you know, you've, you're clearly on the road to recovery. So I think that's positive, but it really shows you last year was a significant impact. Um, so different businesses. Um, were impacted uh, different industry sectors. Uh, accommodation, which is the hotel and food service sector, really, you know, they had a 60% negative hit on average monthly employment um, as a result of COVID. That was your sector most impacted. The construction industry, though, in um, um, Sherbridge has been doing pretty good. Um, you have a few new businesses, you've had added employment. I think some of that was people trying to um, add in health and hygiene um, amenities to their businesses. Sometimes people then were spending time at home saying, oh my, we've got to fix it. But there's also, I think uh, there's more than that. People then took the time to do some planning and uh, construction has been going pretty well statewide despite the rise of um, cost of materials. Uh, the only other sector that had a little positive blip was professional and technical services. Um, but you know, you know, administrative waste management that includes office support services uh, that also uh, was negatively impacted as well as information computers and wholesale trade. Uh, other services are your barbers, your hair salons, your home, you know your personal care uh, uh, services. So virtually every sector was impacted. Uh, and this is just the numbers on, um, that reflect in the earlier graph. Uh, so basically in terms of you know, change in business establishments, uh, there was no net change, but you had six new construction uh, businesses and you had some losses. You had a losses in you know the leisure and hospitality, accommodation, and food service. You had losses in healthcare and social services, um, and you also had the employment losses. And again, leisure and hospitality lost 770 jobs, um, and other uh, large ones was retail trade as well as healthcare and social assistance. So. Um, those were the big hits. So, as a community that benefits immensely from uh, rooms tax and meals tax, that is an important part of your budget, I think it's useful to kind of look at meals tax revenues. And they, they've plummeted. Um, from, you know, um, you were at almost a half a million dollars just in meals tax revenues in 2019. And you lost basically $150,000, $160,000 in revenue to the town. Uh, I am not 
clear that that partial is as positive as we would like to think it is because DOR changed how it is collecting revenue. So it looks more positive than it is. I don't think we had really that. And this is calendar year, not fiscal year. Um, yeah, that's right. So <laughs> There's no way that's right then. Yeah, no. Um, so I, I, the 238, you will say, oh, well, we're in a pretty good recovery. Well, this, that includes advanced payments. So think of that as at least a half a year, if not three, um, three quarters. So um, rooms tax, um, again, you can see the hit. You, you, you average over a million dollars a year in rooms tax. Uh, you took a half a million dollar hit. So rooms and hotel taxes, you've lost a million dollars in your budget. As I'm sure the select board is painfully aware of this year. Uh, and that has, you know, 61,000 um, this year for the first quarter, which, um, you know, jam the first quarter is always a little weak, but that's, that's a really weak first quarter. So I'm seeing a lot of nodding that. So there's been a lot of impacts. Um, so let, let, let's try and look at some brighter items. I know that you've all been dealing with the budget and you're painfully aware of some of it, but Sturbridge has some real strengths. And sometimes when you think about what you have to improve or do, we lose sight of some of the strengths. And um, you know, the fact that um, I did a series of interviews both with uh, people within Sturbridge as well as the region, uh, with businesses, with uh, uh, elected leaders, with um, you know regional organizations, and you know people really praised your staff uh, and uh, really commented about how Sturbridge has uh, a track record of hiring high quality staff, and I think that's really important, and it's really important for economic development as well as just municipal governance, and I want to I want to share that. Because I think, uh, I don't always hear that. I, in fact, I rarely hear it. So I think that's a real um, real plus for Sturbridge. Um, I think the fact that you have a strong civic culture and volunteerism is a strength. You've made real strides in coordinating permitting. Uh, that is a real plus in terms of um, development. All Sturbridge Village, you know, is a clear strength. Um, you've got you know, the historic town common, which is very picturesque with the public house. Um, your, one of your strengths, and it's kind of a weakness too, is that you have a strong hospitality sector. And I can't, I can't underestimate that you've got great highway location, but that's the kind of thing we take for granted. I, will, I want to ask you guys, do you see any difference in awareness of Sturbridge now that there's no longer a toll booth? As to traffic. Good or bad? Bad. This. And now I don't, I'm ashamed to say I don't even know what exit number we are. <laughs> now that they changed the exit number. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> but, but I will say, I don't think it's as visible because it used to be that every time, every Memorial Day, every Fourth of July, every Labor Day, every Thanksgiving, every Christmas, Sturbridge would be on the news. And that's true. Well, but sometimes it can be good. It wasn't about the community. It was about the toll. But it made it increased your visibility. That's true. And you don't have that. And there is no longer when you're getting off the pike. It doesn't say Sturbridge. It says New York and Hartford. So you might want to change that because. You know, people think Sturbridge, and if you're not as prominent. Those of us who are perhaps older, but younger people who aren't, you know, haven't, you know, gone through the headaches of the tolls. <laughs> um, you know, some of those tolls are becoming a, a distant memory. So I, th I think th be aware of that in terms of awareness. 
you know, some of the other positives is you got, you know, craft breweries and you've got a really good restaurant cluster that draws people. Um, people think of Sturbridge in terms of wedding planning. Uh, you've got outdoor trails. There's a, you know, there is a high awareness of uh, Sturbridge as a location, but I think, I think it's a soft belly issue as we just talked about. So you've got some really good things. You've got very good internet connection. You've got a good school system. You have a history of using tax incentives. So you're doing well on a lot of fronts. So what's weak? You know, now that I've sung your praises, what do we need to kind of sharpen the uh, edge on? You, um, in today's world, when people are thinking about residential you know, places to live, as well as places to visit, walkability is increasingly an amenity that is kind of on people's to-do list. And that the fact that real estate brokers and Zillow post walk scores, and even sometimes TripAdvisor puts walk scores, and your walk scores don't, are in the tank. Um, so, Thinking about how to enhance walkability is really important. And that also would address some of your traffic issues because if you don't have to you know, get in your car to cross Route 20 or go 500 feet, not everyone, but every time you can eliminate a turning vehicle, that helps on traffic movements. Your retail sector is not what it once was. And that's that's true all over, and I think we need to think about retail. There's commodity, you know, yes, there's online competition, and that's not going away. And certainly the COVID accelerated people adopting online and e-commerce. But if you think of online commerce for retail as more commodities that people, you know, um, people will buy blue jeans online because they know what, it's the same, they buy the same pair the same kind every time. If they're buying a gift, they, they may not buy it online. They're looking for something special. That impulse shopping, that discretionary shopping, that's what you know, visitor and res you know, um, business district retail is more about, is the discretionary shopping, not the big commodity shopping. Because you can't compete price-wise and with delivery. So I think it's important to differentiate between commodity and retail. Um, so, I th you know, and the other thing is that it's really the experience economy on retail, so that people are looking at services. I, I've mentioned the example of the bird store. You know, they link up and say, oh, well, there's a birding hike, and then, you, you know, they're encouraging people to take experiences and then patronize their store. Sometimes restaurants can do it and say, oh, there's going to be a wine tasting and we're going to pair it with different meals. And different retailers can do different ways of doing that or service brokers are saying, well, we have a specialist coming, you know, the district manager or specialist in this area is coming. And it creates an experience, it creates a happening and that helps that's of interest to residents, but it's also of interest to visitors. So it helps keep, um, give people a reason to come to a shop. So that hasn't been as adopted as much in Sturbridge as I think you probably need to think about. So that's a weakness. Um, there's few childcare options. Um, as I mentioned about walkability, placemaking is part of that. Um, we talked about I-84. You really don't have transit, and you really don't have that much presence of Uber or Lyft. Um, so thinking about how in the future, because people, you know, if people are staying in a hotel in uh, Worcester, they might take a Uber to see Old Surbridge Village. Or if someone wants to stay here, they might want, and they want to go to a Woo Sox game, they might take a you know, Uber or Lyft. So, you laugh, but I'm sometimes amazed at you know um, what people will do with Uber and Lyft. So um, I laugh because I have taken people from Brimfield shows 
back places because they thought they could just get an Uber because they're from New York City. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> it's like, what do you mean you don't is have it, any way of getting it, out of here? Is it, is it <laughs> <and> everywhere? <laughs> no, not here. So, I mean, but th that doesn't mean it could be here at some point in time. Um, yeah, I think there's some elements of regional cooperation. Um, I think probably strengthening that would be a, a good idea and, and making sure Sturbridge interest is, is um, uh, not assumed, but also part of the equation on regional partnerships. So, um, so some of the opportunities, I would say implementing the commercial tourism district plan uh, is an opportunity. I want to say your trails are an opportunity. I think the Quinnebog River, you have a strong uh, level of self-employment and entrepreneurialism in uh, Sturbridge that I think needs to be tapped. Uh, I think developing arts and cultural amenities and venues is kind of, uh, it, it's an omission and it's an opportunity. Um, Looking, I think you could look at the entrance to the pike as potential land, uh, and I think you could enhance some of your development opportunities because there's, you know, many people I talk to in town say, well, we don't have any land, we can't do development. Well, perhaps we need to think about how, how to do development. Sometimes we have high parking requirements, sometimes we, you know, um, and I think you always have to balance because people really do use cars here. They don't rely on Uber. So, but thinking uh, through, I think the host is an opportunity that needs to be um, cultivated. And just looking at how this can be more of a hub for looking at, you know, you can go visit Hartford, you can go visit Springfield, you can go visit uh, Worcester, but you can stay in Sturbridge and have the best of all worlds. Um, your threats, the pandemic. Um, Old Sturbridge Village is one of your greatest assets, but since it's kind of like the only game in town, it's also kind of a threat. Their health is important, so their 75th anniversary is wonderful, and I'm glad they're celebrating, and they've certainly diversified. Um, you have been a meeting destination. And um, the adoption of virtual meetings and online conferences is a challenge, particularly to your smaller venues, um, because people haven't always stayed up to date with um, meeting technology. Um, and you know, so I think that that's both an opportunity and a challenge. Um, the lack of consensus about growth in Sturbridge is also a real challenge. And I think uh, I'll talk more about that. Um, and hotel, uh, hotel and room taxes, those tr that's such an important part of your economy. And I know you want to diversify your economy, but it, you know, a, mi a million and a half dollars is not a small part of a municipal budget. Um, and it the amenities of why meals tax, why you're generating meals taxes, also make you an attractive place for residents. So I think it's not um, what benefits the tourism industry also makes you more attractive as a place to live. And I think sometimes people forget that because sometimes people are thinking about the traffic in Greenfield. So let me talk about key findings. Um, and are there any questions so far? I'm sorry I'm talking, but feel free to inter uh, interrupt. I, I'm not trying to be uh, a monologue. Um, the, the number of business and local economy, you can, you're continuing to grow, but you're continuing to grow slowly. And I, th I think probably, the, uh, I compared you with the US, Massachusetts, Worcester County, and Sturbridge. Um, and um, business establishments, the number of business establishments, you're growing, you're growing slightly slower than the rate of business establishment growth in the country, but slower than the state and slower than Worcester County. 
A business establishment is a business that employs people. It could be one person or two person, but it's an employer. In terms of employment, the number of jobs over the last 15 years, the change rate, you're, at, you're increasing about 1.1%. Uh, which is again slower than Worcester County, um, you know, at least a half a point slower than the Commonwealth. Um, so you're steady, um, and you really want to kind of be growing a, a little, probably a little more than 1.1. Uh, on population, you're also, you know, um, you're growing about four tenths of a percent. Um, since 2010, and note the first two are 2005, uh, and the last one is 2010. It's a little different time period. You had a big growth spurt in population in the first decade of, um, two th of the 21st century. But since 2010, it's kind of totally slowed down. And I think that's, that's why I changed it, because it really, um, you wouldn't see that slowing down, and I think that's what's important to really look at. So you're growing, but very slowly. So that really means that you've got to help your existing businesses because you're not you're not growing. Um, your economic development needs to be focused on internal growth as well as perhaps attraction. I also am really sensing that as you're growing slowly, you know, there's been an interest over the years to not be as dependent on leisure and hospitality. Wanting leisure and hospitality, but not being as dependent. And, you know, I'm seeing some diversification. It's happening slowly. It's happening um, more quickly than your growth rate. Uh, you know, healthcare and social assistance have really increased, uh, both in terms of jobs as well as the um, number of um, business, businesses. Uh, you've got professional and technical services uh, has been increasing in terms of jobs as well as the number of uh, establishments. Um, it, uh, you know, manufacturing has been relatively steady, um, though it's not growing as quickly. It's really kind of a steady piece. Uh, education has increased. So you are getting more diversity in your economy than you had 10 years ago. So I think that's a good thing. Uh, and, you know, leisure and hospitality is, is still very important. These are all pre-COVID numbers. Obviously, as I mentioned, there was a hit of loss of 770 jobs, so about 60% uh, decrease in leisure and hospitality. Hopefully over you know, um, the next year, I think restaurants will come back um, probably pretty strong this year. Um, but again, restaurants and hospitality businesses are looking have are, are learning on how to automate and minimize some of their employment job creation issues but you really need the meal sales and from a municipal bu budget operations um, one of the key findings is you have a diversity of opinion about development uh, and economic development in, in Sturbridge. And some of those uh, opinions are very strongly held and are passionate. Um, and sometimes it really is kind of like that image that people are kind of sometimes yelling at each other. Uh, and um, that doesn't help you. And it's actually contributed to an image of Sturbridge is not when I look at the facts, you're kind of a welcoming community to business. But when the rancor overshadows that and, people, and has an image that you're not business friendly. So you've, that's not to say I favor debates. I think debate is good. But I think figuring out how you can have the debate, which is healthy to figure out what's right for Sturbridge, 
but also not be as rancorous is really important. And I think one of those things is focus on what, where there's agreement. Um, and today, there's a lot of agreement about revitalizing the commercial tourism district. And I think making concrete steps that people can see, as well as some of the you know, softer things, the programmatic things that um, we've talked about, is really important. The commercial tourism district was number two amongst residents and number two by businesses. And there were two different surveys. So it is something that has broad consensus. And I worked with you during that process. So I know not everyone, I know there's some people who are crit were critical. But I think maybe that has, is not as shrill as it once was. But it's time to move forward and to implement. And people need to see things. And I think the more you tackle things where there's common agreement, then you, know, you can still work on having that debate and figuring out how to move forward. Um, parking and traffic continue to be key. Walkability is part of the equation. I think it's monitoring. I think some of the commercial tourism district traffic improvements um, would help with it. Um, you know, the, the pro problem is Route 20 is a basically a two-lane road. Access management would help. Turning lanes could help. Um, it's, it's an issue you're going to have to monitor. It's, it's kind of like a fact of, fact of life. I mean, better to have it. You know, what you want to do is have enable the traffic that does go through Sturbridge to stop in Sturbridge and patronize businesses and not just whip, whip through. So I don't have a, you know, um, there's no silver bullet here, um, it, but it's something that requires continuous work. Um, you've got more competition than you used to uh, being a meeting uh, location. Obviously, uh, Zoom and GoToMeeting are competitors. Uh, people still are interested in face-to-face -face meetings, um, but I think, you know, when I talk to people, and I, I'm involved in several statewide organizations, people now think of Worcester more than I hear Sturbridge in terms of a meeting place that meets for both Western Mass and Eastern Mass. And I think you've got to recapture that. And um, I actually think, you know, Terry and the Tourism Committee might want to develop a meeting outreach program to re solidify your relationships with major meeting groups uh, and really kind of get that. But that also means some of your businesses have to kind of put their best foot forward and add some spit shining polish. Um, I think you've upgraded your website so it's much better than it was. But I think in this day and age, it's really a process of continuous improvement. I think looking at some mobile apps for marketing tourism is going to be real important because people use their um, smartphones basically as, um, you know, kind of like a life. If I don't know what to do, I look it up on my phone. So, I mean, those are just ubiquitous. And having a tourism app and a visit Sturbridge or visit commercial tourism that links with local businesses with ordering and other things could be a real real plus um, you know again I think on marketing um, you can you can never have too many partners uh, to help get the word out but I think it's also important to make sure Sturbridge is part of their agenda as well as your agenda so it's a shared agenda um, was really interesting. 11.2% of town residents are self-employed. That is much higher than the Commonwealth, much higher than uh, Worcester County. That, that's like an opportunity waiting. That means, you know, some people may be retired and doing consulting, um, but that's good. They're bringing in income. Uh, some people may be starting, you know, uh, um, ha just have a small business and may be happy with that, but it's also people who may be interested in growing. So 
thinking about that as, you know, you've got kind of 11% of the people who live here are, are basically seedlings for business. You know, let's help them germinate. Let's help them grow. And some of that might be small businesses services. And the fact that you have a staple, is a real, that's an important business here. Um, that you might not think of, but that's part of your economic development effort, um, particularly in the professional technical services realm. Uh, and I think you saw that with the number of construction you know, shingles going up in terms of business starts. Um, you had six new construction business starts in 2020. Um, there's a whole concept of collaborative workspace or co-working where people, you know, their business is out for on their house or maybe they don't want to hear their kids or their uh, kid coming in um, during the Zoom and there's been, uh, you know, we've, the last 18 months everyone's been very flexible but I think people have also learned that I need some elbow room or I need to get out of the house. So you might really want to think about some collaborative workspace. And that could be in your commercial tourism district, you know, because it's like, okay, I can go, go grab lunch, there's other services. And sometimes people want to bump into each other and they can find projects together. And it's a way to build the network. Uh, if, you're wa if you're wanting to help grow self-employment to a self small business, some of the small business technical assistance programs, working with SCORE or Center for Women in Enterprise, working with local lenders, and, and helping people become aware of that. And some of that you could do at a collaborative um, workspace. So I think this is a real opportunity. I also want to talk about child care. This um, graph is from 2018, and I was looking at it, and I was really surprised of what I colored as the two gold squares. I mean, for the most part, Sturbridge is kind of mirrors and go, you know, on unemployment. The unemployment was like you were right aligned with the Commonwealth of Worcester County. I was surprised that there was such a drop in terms of parents in Sturbridge compared to elsewhere in the Commonwealth and uh, was uh, Worcester County. And I was so curious, I also looked it up for every single town around Sturbridge. And you kind of stand out. Um, so it really struck me that you, there's a, a very active moms group, and, but it's not, it doesn't appear that it's just people choosing to stay at home with their kids. So that's a valid and appropriate choice. Uh, and if you can do it, more power to, to you. Um, but, you know, when you look at the la last number, once the kids are 6 to 17, labor force participation by, women, uh, by both parents pops up to 81%. So at one time you're the high and the other time you're the low. So it really strikes me that there's a, there's a child care issue here. So I looked at the availability of, of child care. Because people usually want child care close to where their home is or close to where they work. Um, and what struck me is you have no infant slots here. You have a lot of young families. I mean, Sturbridge has a ton of kids. You know that from your school budget. Um, but you, you have a fair number of providers, and it might look that you have, like you have a lot of child care slots. But when I look at children under five per available child care slot, you're kind of in, in, on the low side. This is a business opportunity for someone. Either one of the existing providers can expand, or someone could locate, or you could recruit someone. And you know, you might want to work with the moms group to see, you know, get a better sense of the needs. But I think this is a real opportunity. And there's certainly been conversations nationally that, with the pandemic, people are certainly aware of 
the care economy and the need for childcare to enable women, but sometimes it's dads, um, to be able to return to work. And I think it's going to be a little harder here because there's not as many spaces. There, you don't have the slots. So I think, I think it's really, I think that's a, uh, an area that's ripe for action. And you can, you know, you can, you know, by help someone start a business, have a new business, and provide a needed service. Over the last 20 years, you have been making significant investments as a community and many, many volunteer hours in your trail system. And this is, you know, it's, 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 a, deep, it's a deep secret. Uh, you need to be marketing it. It's, you know, uh, if anything, COVID helped wake up people in the beauty of the outdoors. And you have some real treasures here. And it's a way to broaden the experience. So, you know, not only can you go to Old Sturbridge Village, you have miles of trails. You know, it's a good day trip. It's, you know, you could package day trips with, you know, breweries and, or, you know, box lunches. You know, <coughs> it's, it's a real opportunity. And adding some interpretation, because not, you know, you've got a really <coughs> avid trails committee, but really adding some interpretation, both from a historical as well as a, a natural systems perspective, could really augment that. And um, so, you know, you've made a huge investment. You have a huge uh, amounts of conservation land, and you've made trail system. Capitalize on it more. It's one of your best kept secrets. Um, I mentioned the experience economy. Um, the survey of residents indicated a lot of interest in arts and culture activities. It was on, on the top 10 things that people wanted. Um, it's also something that enriches the um, visitor experience. So, you know, if there are residents or volunteers or groups of citizens that are interested in arts and culture, I think we want to kind of help uh, nurse that along. I know the Stage Loft Theater is looking for a new home. Keeping them in Sturbridge, that's an, you know, would be, is, is important. Um, I mentioned this earlier. Um, in the upper right is the um, aerial. Um, with the roundabout um, having a new entry off of uh, I-84 into Sturbridge. You, the land, I'm going to point, I didn't bring a pointer, but this triangle that if you had a roundabout would go into it, but the land that's it's it's part of the it's part of the right of way. It's part of of Route 20, and um, it's not even a taxable parcel. But it, you could get a 32,000 square foot lot out of that, and you'd have access on your road route. Having those discussions with the Commonwealth, I think, is it's time. And you've got the. Um, Mass Highway, Depot, Yard, that's a 12-acre site. And the State Police Barracks is four acres. That's 16 acres. Those are huge amounts of land used, you know, and those are important services. We want them. We want to keep them in Sturbridge. But they could be realigned to probably be more efficient, and you could get some more land. For development. And I think as you're thinking through the redevelopment of this, um, I think you could add at least two, if not three or four parcels of like an acre in size, which is not sm small potatoes.
So I have been talking a long time. So I want to thank you for being very observant listeners, because I've been watching people's faces. But I would, uh, I'd love to hear some discussion, reactions, questions. If I'm all wet, let me know. Terry? Again, I want to thank you. It was very thorough. And I think there's a lot of ideas that are things we have to look upon to work together, short term and long term, and very specific. And um, so again, thank you. And one, I could throw out 10 points. One interesting is that part of our hotel revenue decline is not as much COVID. And, and I think I can say this without any criticism is that there is a perception that the host has kind of declined for a lot of different reasons over the years, and we're trying to help Yogi any way we can to elevate that, because that's a 225 room hotel. That's one of the bigger cruise ships that's in the port for us, versus the others are 80 or 90 or 60. So I think your points are well taken, that that is a huge economic asset. And they're starting to book events, and we're seeing that in applications to the STA board, so that's all to the positive. Every time you drive by the building, there seems to be a new physical improvement to the exterior of the property. Um, there was a great big banner there today welcoming some big convention. So, so I think your points about that are well taken. I also think your point about the growth of self-individualized businesses, for lack of a better word, single entrepreneurs or one, two, or three, is that there is um, the mill yard building I am going to talk to the Milliard building owner about the state assistance to help study whether he would like to open up some collaborative space within the property. Because when you walk through the Milliard, it is stunning to see the diversity, class A office space, retail, dance studio, eateries. I mean, it's, it's and yet you drive by and you probably don't think twice about it. So that is a good asset to well, leverage. There, there is a collaborative workspace grant that includes capital money for fit out from mass development that's due July 2nd. Uh, um, so if they're interested, let's, for, let's go. I also want to thank you for your suggestion about mass cultural grants. We are reaching out to um, the stage wealth. We've talked to them many times to let make sure they're connected and aware of that. So that was a they also provide planning grants to help you do the strategic plan because one of the I love arts and culture but there uh, there are many uh, entities in the, uh, the fact that the stage loft theater has existed for uh, I think it's 19 years you know it, it's you know they probably need a strategic plan and if they're going to take a big leap you know we don't build it and think the dollars will come we, we all learned, and I think uh, Mass Cultural really wants um, cultural organizations to be fiscally health, healthy and is well aware of the challenges and applauds all the sweat equity, but they will provide planning grants to help people address some of that, really looking at that critical look that's really essential. Thank you. I also thoroughly enjoyed the presentation. Are all, Kathleen, are all of these charts on your own PowerPoint in the assessment, or is this in addition none, to the assessment? None of the COVID charts are, but I will make them all available. I, I will leave, a, I, I, ter, I will make sure Terry and Jeff and Jean have all of them. I don't know if this is going to add a lot of work for you, so I don't want to do that. But on some of them, it, you really, I mean, they're so helpful, but you keep, because they're so small, you really can't read, you can't read them. You oh, can't read on them. that, yeah. On this one, so yeah. I was wondering if you might be able to, to do it so that there's only like two on a page. Yeah, so now, that was, it. so I could, they could look at it this afternoon to see if I made any glaring. Yeah, glasses. well, because I, I mean, I don't wear glasses yet, and I was like, wow, I can't, because um, I was trying to look at the I, other yeah, no, and stuff. I, I, if you could I, do that, I, that's I am happy to do that. Oh, okay. Do not squint your eyes. Okay. Anymore, so. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I can, you know, I can read the heading, but when you try to do the detail, you just can't. I have a black and white version here that I can uh, read. Right. Nice. Uh, this, uh, if anyone wants to read it tonight, but you, you know, 
No and then I'm, okay, awesome. And then I'm just curious, um, and I, I'm assuming it's in here, but the surveys you did, and when you talked to residents, resident groups and business groups, um, what methodology did you use, and how much of a response, to, like how many groups I, actually I, participated I, 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 to um, make this happen? On the resident survey, um, it was, we, we did that when Kevin Filchuk was um, economic development coordinator. We, uh, and it kicked off during the uh, fall harvest days, right. and we had over 200 responses on, on uh, excuse me, on the resident survey. And I, I find that, you know, Is that it's not as, I, I, I mean, think Kevin, I told Kevin if we got at least 200, I'd be happy, because I think it's a good indicator uh, and cross section. Do you ask what age group that corresponds to of those 200? People? Yeah, I mean, um, because I was just curious, like when you said there's no child care, we don't know if they're choosing to be stay at home. I did not. We did not I mean, ask uh, about the 200. I didn't know it wasn't right. sure. No, no, but I mean of the 200 people, if 150 are retirees, we don't get as much of a sense of working families what they want and need. So I was right. curious. I, mean, I, I think the next step on child care is really to talk to the moms group. Right, and but. On the survey, did we ask what age group they fell into? We did. Um, if you did, I, I have to double check. Okay. And um, Terry has a copy of the business uh, of the survey report, which includes business the two two business surveys as well as the residents. And how many businesses? <coughs> did you know to be about? honest, I don't remember the number of business responses. But I, it was a small amount. But yeah, I was going to comment. I don't know if you felt it. I, Our businesses don't, um, you know, you could probably correct me, but this is just my perception because initially when we created the tourist and economic development position, Kevin Filchek was the first person to hold it. He initially had a lot of lunches or breakfasts periodic three or four times a year, and I, I would go to them. And to be honest with you, I kind of stopped myself when I got busy because the turnout increasingly declined. So I don't personally feel like our businesses themselves, at least in terms of when the town has taken the initiative, get together that much. I mean, we have the big hitters showing up, the public house and a couple hotels, but the smaller little retail shops along Route 20 and stuff. They don't have time. They well, they don't have time, but did they have time to, so, so I mean, how many businesses actually responded to you? Because that kind of, I don't, I don't yeah. remember the number. I, don't I have found it's not unique to storage. Small business doesn't have time. Doesn't if there's something specific, they'll respond. But if you're just asking them, you know, to take a survey, your opinion, forget it. Yeah. Okay. So the only way to do that yeah. is if they're in their shop, you you you, know, you hand it out, you know, and say I'm going to be back in an hour and a half. And if it's a, and, and you don't do it when they're busy. Has a small time, they might fill it up. But most business, small business people, they have to be in their shops. They're doing ordering before, you know, beforehand. They're doing their books late at night. Right. You know, I get it. No, my husband's self employed. I understand. How yeah. did you, um, how did we then survey businesses to increase the term? I think. Did we mail it? I, I don't recall anymore. I'm sure we were told not, at the time. But um, email. Yeah. How did we survey? Says, they were mailed. Kevin, they were he gets delivered to Kevin did the distribution. There was an email blast. I think there was some hand distribution at meetings. Okay. Yeah, I also want to caution that you have to look at the number of businesses that you have and what the percentage of response is. Because sometimes people say, oh, you only got 20 responses. Well, if your business district only has 130 businesses, 20 is pretty good. Right, that's why I was wondering. Yeah, we so, I mean, so, but it, but it, because you're looking at how 20, 20 responses, how can, you know, I think we got indicators. There weren't things that su really surprised me on the business survey. I mean, they, there were things that I had heard, traffic's a problem, you know, so, I mean, um, there, I don't think there was real, I don't recall real surprises. 
And my last question. Businesses is, will let you know when they're not happy. Oh, I, I get it. You know, I know. They're more likely to do that than be proactive because they're trying to be proactive on their business. They're happy, they don't care. <laughs> No news is good news, right? This is my last question, I'll let somebody else. Um, yeah. The other thing I found very interesting is you said, that I think it was a threat or a challenge that we don't all have the perception of economic development in town. We have diverging views. Now, is that coming um, primarily from the results of the survey on the resident side? It's or from, from talking to people. Talking, okay, I didn't know where. I, mean, uh, I think your perception is correct, and I personally um, kind of honed in when you said it. Because you're not going to change people's view of why they feel Sturbridge is their home. That's not going to change. People are attached to it for different reasons. You know, but I think your advice about focusing on projects where there is common ground as opposed to controversial ones that are going to split the town. Why don't we start with working on projects that are bring it together, <laughs> you which is Route 20. You can make a lot of progress on economic development if you work where there's agreement. And that's Route 20 from your... From your yeah, I mean, Route 15 is like a hot potato, and it brings, you know, you're going you're gonna to you're gonna have another war. Right. Get some things done. That's not to say you might not revisit it, but if you start to build some, you know, conversations, then maybe you can have a more civil discussion. Maybe there's some other, you know, technology you may develop. You may think that there may be some other options. But according to your slide, I think you were saying that the, the consensus is around the The commercial tourism district was rated number two as a priority right. amongst residents and number two as a priority amongst businesses. And traffic was number one. So, I mean, the commercial tourism district nibbles at your number one issue and it addresses your number two issue. And people feel better and they're less grouchy if they see some progress. A question, kind of a comment and a question. I think all of us in this room know that our trail system is our hidden gem. And we also all know that every study we've done for the past at least 16 years that I've been here, people want to see more in terms of arts and entertainment. So my question is, is there a way to use our trail system to cultivate the arts? For instance, I've been in other communities where maybe there's a photography club that is out on the trails and they're doing their photography lessons or they're doing painting in a field. Is there, how do you get that synergy going so that you have artists wanting to, I'll say, exploit our trails in a good way? to help build the arts, and then maybe you have spin-offs off of that? Um, I think those are both good ideas. Um, I happen to be on a nonprofit that um, works with a DCR pro property. And we do a focus event every fall. And to be honest, it's really hard to get people to participate. And I think, I think what, um, and, and it's a way to encourage it and improve visibility. So I think those things are good to do. I think having many, or if there is a Sturbridge Camera Club, or you know, there's a Worcester County Camera Club, kind of seeing if they might be interested, kind of trying to find partnerships and doing it all yourself. And I would say the same thing with the planet air. I think the other piece you might want to think about is thinking about sculpture. You know, sometimes you could have a temporary installation that people have to walk and then they discover it. You know, and that um, you know that takes planning on you know it's, you know, and maybe it's like oh we'll do you know, and it's not just. Um, memorial or tributary, you know, it might be kind of avant-garde, but, it, you know, I'm not talking about like Richard Serra kind of sculpture that caused a lot of um, controversy in the 60s and 70s, but, if, you know, I think some, you know, um, Stockbridge, um, 
Well, the Chester, and Chester Wood and Stockbridge did a sculpt, has done a sculpture uh, interpretation of their gardens periodically. So that might be an example. But there's not there's not other people around there doing that, so it might be something that you do incrementally. Yeah. Um, or you, you know, or you might do it in town and then do it in, you know, on different sites. I mean, obviously you've got to work with your conservation commission and your trails commission. There's also temporary installations like, you know, sometimes, and lighting is always controversial because you've got to be careful of the creatures. Um, but sometimes there's, you know, some, you know, temporary lighting that might be, you know, of interest. And you can think of using solar power to do that, um, so it's less intrusive. So lighting is a way to do it. I know Old Church Village has now adopted a holiday light program. Um, but thinking about, um, you know, sometimes there's other temporary installations that can add color, but not harm um, the natural environment. And I would think about, again, partnering, seeing if you can partner, whether it's with a school, um, art school, or, you know, just bring, you know, arts extension at UMass, just so that you bring in some, uh, some expertise. And you may have some people who have that uh, passion and interest locally. Thanks. All right. I just wanted to thank you for the presentation. You made a comment that I was really happy about. You made a comment that it was time to approach the Commonwealth about the land that they own in this town. Because I agree. I feel like the state owned barn is probably the nicest piece of commercial property in this town that could attract business. The state has it strangled by us. State police barracks as well. And, and there's ways to keep them and have that easy access to Mass Highway. But and, and that's not an overnight conversation. It's not going to happen right now. But you've got, you know, um, you've got a pretty decent delegation right now. So start the conversation. So, um, so I came from a town before I moved here, the, the very local business community oriented, to speak to the arts. That, that you brought up. Um, they do things like um, they did cows. So they had these oh, right. cow sculptures all over yes. Pittsfield, right? And different organizations sponsored a cow. At Christmas, they downtown Main Street, you know, businesses uh, donated a tree and decorated it for their business so that people would come downtown. They have buskers on the streets at night, you know, outside the restaurants, entertaining people when they leave. I mean, there's yes. a lot of ways to do it. At, at Halloween, they bring the high school kids in, and they take windows in all of the stores, and the stores give up their windows for two or three days. And it brings people out because they want to see what's going on, and it brings people into the business community. So there are ways to do it that are kind of fun and sort of get everybody involved instead of trying to find little groups for, you know, special projects. So I just would throw that no, out. No, I'm glad. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, because that's the area I come from, Stockbridge and Brickyard. Yeah, well, yeah, speaking of the cows, I mean, some people have done pigs, some people have done shoes, some people have done They did garbage chairs. cans. They got really nice garbage cans, mm -hmm. and then they had people paint them so that yes. it's not just ugly garbage cans. But, but that's shoes. something you could do as a temporary thing, maybe with, um, and that I've seen people then auction them afterwards. That's exactly what they do. Fundraiser. Yeah. So that might be something to do with your trails. So they, different artists sign up, they, you know, they get this, you know. Scatter the hunts on the trails. They already did, the trails did something last year with ice sculptures in the wintertime. That's yeah. a great. Yeah. Yeah. That was really popular. Yeah. That was and they decorated Christmas we take a picture because yeah. we've done that. Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, in many ways, you're doing some of these things already. It's kind of telling the story, getting it out, and intensifying it, and looking at other examples. And I think, I think tying, tying in an organization with these activities is 
key. We really do. One of the universities or um, you know, WPI is with the end with, with the trails. Uh, WPI is a participant now, and, and they have you know so they're making a bridge. They're making a bridge. They're, they've been on different trips. So if we can do that with like cross country um, bikes and stuff like that, tie it in with the high school or organizations, I think it would. COVID particularly exploded the, the trail knowledge here in Stuart too, because people were forced. Yeah, no, that was the yeah, only yeah, thing yeah, that helped yeah. kind of yeah, you know, yeah. uh, uncover your hidden gem. Yeah. But it's something, you know, don't cover it up yet. No, no. <laughs> One thing we can't do is chickens. <laughs> <laughs> Building that kind of 
um, more of the network social fabric on the raising the awareness and giving those people an opportunity yeah. to let other people know what services they provide. And a lot of towns across the country with this collaborative business are offering like financial incentives for people who have creative skills to come to this area and if they stay for a year and they participate and volunteer their well, time. Well, the best example there is Duke and Kentucky that did for, you know, arts. They, they would give you a house, you know, that was torn down. Well, Duke and Kentucky is at the river of Ohio and Mississippi and was a really depressed economy. It really depressed economy. So they had a lot of houses. They had surplus houses. So they would get, you know, if someone would sign and say, that, you know, it was almost like a homestead act instead of a land that was for a house if you were an artist. So they built an artist community, essentially. If we're having an affordable housing problem, we're not giving away stuff at this right. point. No. So, I mean, I think, you, got, you know, that's an example where some people use an asset they had as a, as a lure, you know, and it was, success, it was successful, you know. Um, but I think that we did ask about affordable housing on the business survey. And we did not get a lot of interest, and it might be the, not, the businesses who responded. So um, I'm aware that that's particularly an issue. Um, you've, and if, I think, um, it's, you know, you also have uh, people who are over 65 who are living in some of the existing affordable housing. Sometimes people, you know, at 65 to 75 are kind of swing surplus labor force. Um, but you need to replenish it, you know. So it, it, is, it is an issue. I didn't have enough documentation to really say that, but my affordable housing issue all over the county. I mean, and prices have skyrocketed, so. And our housing production plan is just approved by the Department of Housing and Community Development. Okay. So we do have a plan in place now, and we'll work, we are, one of our first steps will be towards creating a housing trust that can work on some of the housing affordability issues going yeah. forward. That's great. Cool. So we do know it's a, a problem. I mean, there's a lot of things to do. You just, you kind of have to kind of knock some off every year and keep working on it and then be assessed. Well, to that point, as Gene's working on housing, we did get the first phase of the commercial tours to district plan, the Rotary, Rotary paid for and to be designed by DOT. Mm -hmm. So that's on its way. That's huge. And now the next phase, and Gene and I will talk about this, we need to engage an engineer to work locally with us on phase two and go parcel by parcel to figure out how that phase two is going to work. And I think, the 20, I think the 2015 plan has the basis for that, so it's, it's kind of fine-tuning it. So you're not, start, you're not starting from scratch, which is wonderful. I think the, one of the things that resonated with me most that you were saying was you were talking about the commercial tourism district and there's consensus on that. I, as long as I've been with the chamber, which is like, I don't know, something like 16 years now, we've been talking about a bloody commercial tourism district. Have we not? Oh, yeah. You've been a selectman that whole time. Practically so. Practically. <laughs> so, and it's been in the master plan and it's been a priority. And there was an economic development committee that said, you know, was making all kinds of recommendations and stuff. And it's like nothing ever happened. <coughs> and I think people are sick to death of it. So when you say you need to show some progress, yeah, I what I hear happened. is physical, mm -hmm. obvious, tangible. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, being able, you know, if someday there could be a river walk I know that there has been effort to try to get those last couple of pieces, but it's like, oh, for God's sakes, is that ever going to happen? That's the bridge that WPI, remember? Okay. Yep. Yep. Yes. And that's the parking lot that we just acquired for, to serve the businesses, but also 
you'll be able to get on the trail to go to the river walk in yeah. there as well. It'll Sometimes be it's better to build, you know, build, you know, twenty percent of it than build the next twenty, and it kind of kind of forces the issue with peer pressure about the remaining. But I mean, it's taken me three town managers before someone got it on the tip and got some money to work <laughs> on it. So yeah. Hats off to Jeff for doing it. <laughs> and that's the other issue is it's a state it's highway, yeah. so it's so difficult for us Such to do mess. anything. Yeah. I mean, I think you know you were on my wayfinding committee. <laughs> we tried to put a sign, and DOT rejected it because it could be a projectile. So you know, <laughs> they haven't been the easiest to know. No, I mean, I mean, people want to see, yeah. You ra we raise expectations when we do planning. Right. Yeah. And people want to kind of see something tangible. Um, and I know there's many steps. Believe me, I've, I've been in those trenches and in those meetings and it's like, well, we took a baby step forward and then three steps back with this other thing because they told us we had to do A, B, C, and D. And we, you know, we did G, H, and I, but they want to bother us. So, I recognize it's not always linear, but making some tangible progress is really important. And people these days don't have, they think you can beta test everything. You know. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to thank everyone thank for you. staying. And, um, I wish you all well. And, you know, I hope this gives you kind of a to-do list so that you can, you know, make some progress. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm doing all right, and uh, hopefully it'll be a long time.